Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello and welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar covering coral reefs. Obviously in Australia, we've got some coral reefs out there, um, but we want to uh, give you some content today that's going to cover coral reefs all around the planet. Um, some things that we might be able to do, some things to look out for, what does the future look like and how can we do better? Um, let's start by welcoming all of you, our attendees from all around the world. Um, looks like near the Great Barrier Reef, we've got quite a few attendees, but um, also in other parts of the world as well. And welcome especially to those who are joining us on the YouTube recording, uh, which will be out there for everyone to watch uh, for the very near future. Now, let's get a couple of housekeeping items out of the way today. Um, we will run for approximately 60 minutes today. That includes the presentations and a panel Q&A discussion at the end. Um, if you need to run, uh, or if you're joining us later uh, via recording link, um, everybody will get this recording link emailed to them. Um, do fill out our one minute survey at the end. That will help us to steer our content going forward. Now that you've got two buttons uh, down on your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button and there's a chat button. Now they have two different purposes. The chat button, use that to just communicate with each other and uh, or ask for any assistance. But if you have a technical question for one of the presenters, be sure to use the Q&A button because other attendees will be able to upload those and the most uploaded questions are the ones that we're going to be sure to hit um, during our Q&A session at the end. So without any further ado, let's um, welcome today's experts. Uh, if you can turn on your cameras for us, uh, Jody Salmon and David Rissick, um, with some extensive experience and uh, background uh, covering uh, the topic of coral reefs and uh, many other related uh, subtopics um, that will be of interest to our attendees today. Now, we tend to get a lot of attention from uh, flood modelers for this uh, webinar series. We want to expand our horizons and get into uh, a little more into water quality than we have in the past and some of the implications around climate change and those sorts of topics. And uh, what? who better than uh, Jody and David uh, to help us out today? So if um, if we can get a brief introduction uh, from the two of you, Jody, if you want to just let us know where you're coming to us from and um, what's the last coral reef that you saw with your very own eyes? How long have you been doing what you've been doing? The same questions for David here going forward, but Jody, uh, when was the last time you actually saw a coral reef and um, have you noticed any changes over the time? Thank you for the introduction. So as you mentioned, my name is Jody. I'm from Reef Check Australia and I have been extremely fortunate to work with the company for over 10 years now. So started off as a volunteer and have definitely uh, worked my way up to making sure that we actually have the opportunities to jump into these reefs and monitor them long term. I've also been really lucky that I have been in the water very recently, as recent as uh, Friday was the last time that I was out there actually looking at our different coral reefs. And I was lucky enough to be out on the Great Barrier Reef on Heron Island, which is a beautiful reef and is doing really, really well in comparison to some of the other reef structures that we do have within the Queensland coastline. Excellent. Well, thanks for that introduction. We look forward to hearing your presentation here momentarily. But uh, David, uh, let us know, um, you know, what, how, how long you've been doing what you've been doing and um, you know, when's the last time you got the chance to go out and see uh, some reefs with your very own eyes. Thanks, Craig. Um, good morning, everyone. Yeah, look, you can see my, by my hairstyle that I've been doing this for quite a long time. Um, I I'm, I'm work for a company called BMT and I do a lot of work in climate change adaptation um, but also intersect with wetlands and, and reef ecology and, and also um, reef rehabilitation. So a breadth of different um, um, areas of interest for me. But um, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was fortunate to be um, underwater in Fiji, looking at some reefs there. Um, and unfortunately they weren't in very good condition. There was evidence of, of coral bleaching. There was evidence of land-based runoff and um, um, impacts of, of, of turbidity and, and nutrients starting to really impact um, those reefs close to, to the land. And, and compared to Australia, they're not even really um, hugely populated and, um, and, um, and, and used for agriculture. So really challenging, particularly when you have reefs that are really close to inshore areas. 
Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, we want to have a little bit of both. This happened on our plastics webinar a few uh, a month or two back, where we, we want to give you a little bit of both. Yes, there are some bleak pictures out there. We also want to give you some hope in how we can all make a difference collectively um, and, and how change uh, can actually occur. Um, and it's not something we need to wait 10,000 years for. Uh, we can make differences today. And um, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more from both of our presenters about that. Um, again, most of our focus... Um, it, when you look at our previous webinars, 150 of them to pick from, a lot of our focus has been on waterways and, you know, and not so much on the ocean. Uh, we'd like to dive a little more into the oceans and that topic. We'll have some wind and wave forces and some coastal uh, applications in our uh, webinar series next year. This is a bit of a teaser, a taste of uh, what, uh, where, where you might go. We want to take our waterway specialists here and show how we can look especially at that zone where the ocean and the waterways uh, interact and how those zones are making a difference in our coral reefs. And then from there, um, we hope to get some more interest in, uh, you know, in some of the oceanography topics that we might be introducing uh, next year. So with that, um, I'll turn off my camera here and we're gonna dive straight into Jody's presentation. Uh, Jody, if you can share your screen, uh, what'll happen here is in the background, if you can ask uh, any questions of our presenters in the background, while Jody's doing her presentation, David can be answering some of the questions in the background and uh, then vice versa. When uh, David's doing his presentation, Jody will be uh, um, offering some uh, help on the uh, chat line or on the Q and A line. And then we'll come back on live and do our um, uh, panel discussion uh, in the end uh, for the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so. So with that, um, I'll turn my camera off and head over to, and um, we'll have Jody uh, share her screen. Um, I can see that just fine. If we get that to full screen, um, I'll back off here and let's uh, have a look at the chat line while you are doing your presentation. So over to you, Jody. Perfect. Thank you. Having nice little internet issues there. So that's always fun. Uh, but All coming through perfectly now. So. Perfect. Uh, so thank you everyone for inviting me along for this and it's a beautiful opportunity to kind of have those discussions uh, on the reef structures so it's lovely to hear and be a part of. So without further ado I would like to make sure that we acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we uh, call in from today and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples living in our community today. I'm calling in from Gubby Gubby country on the Sunshine Coast in sunny, very, very warm Queensland at the moment. So a little bit about Reef Check Australia, so you know where I'm from and what we're, we're talking about or what the angle that I'm coming at from. Um, Reef Check Australia is an environmental citizen science organisation. So what that means is that we believe in protecting reefs and oceans by empowering people. And that's essentially through hands-on research hands-on applicator understanding. So whether that's above the water or below the water, anyone can participate because you're citizens collecting science. Globally, it's uh, used to collect globally and, relevant, uh, globally and locally relevant information. So it's really, again, about getting hands-on, going out there, participating, and through the masses, getting lots and lots of data to allow for management application. And it's really important because citizen science can collect information on, the, on a massive scale whereby a lot of institutions have a really small scale or a small area that we can actually look at over the long term. Which really is all about, the, that's the whole point of it, right, is that the area for us, the ocean and reefs are huge. It's a huge area to monitor and protect and no single organisation or individual or group can actually do it by themselves. So essentially it's all about empowering every single person on this call and wider to really understand what their participatory um, components can be and how they can actually give back and also how they can just go out and be a part of any of these different citizen science programs. Now what I wanted to do is for those of you who have heard of the Great Barrier Reef I can see there's lots of people calling in from everywhere around the world. So I am based on southeast Queensland uh, in Queensland in Australia so I wanted to show a couple of reef structures um, that are actually very, very close to me. So we all know about the Great Barrier Reef. We've heard the stories over the past few years of whether it's struggling or not in the recovery and resilience. These photos here, however, are all photos from southeast Queensland. And this one is actually just a few kilometres from my house. Now, if you were to have a look at that photo and without any background information, you would assume that it is on the Great Barrier Reef. But actually, we have these beautiful reef structures living really, really close to the coastline down in southeast Queensland. And some of them, like this is just over a metre of water. 
So you can see that there's some huge, beautiful corals coming through. And also they're very resilient because they're able to actually live in some of these areas. Now, this is on the Sunshine Coast um, and within southeast Queensland, our reefs are predominantly soft coral based. Um, it means that with the Great Barrier Reef, it's a really true coral reef. So if something happens, if there's bleaching events, as, pre, as um, alluded to by Cray, there's as they die, there's actually a coral structure that is left over or a hard skeleton. With soft coral dominated reefs, if they die, there isn't any of that structure left over. So it's quite different in terms of how they actually build. Um, and can replenish. Now what's important is this photo here is actually a place called Goat Island. So that's in about a metre of water, but it also resides in Morton Bay. These photos are from similar areas. So Goat Island and a place called Myora as well. And as you can see, there's somebody duck diving down here and that's on snorkel. So they're really shallow reef structures. And this is really nice hard coral as well. Again, very similar site on the other side of that little spot. And this is all soft coral dominated with a couple of hard corals popped in there. And the reason I kind of wanted to show you all of this is because we can see how absolutely stunning some of these areas are. Again, very, very resilient because they actually live in Morton Bay, which means that every time we have a massive flooding event, all that fresh water comes flooding out along with a bit of debris and it impacts directly onto these really close coral reefs. So the challenge, of course, is we've uh, talked a little bit about climate change. I know that you have had them in previous discussions and there will be a lot more coming up as well. But that is the biggest issue that is actually uh, impacting any of our coral reef structures. Now, the challenge for reefs comes when there's all of these increased pressures and the effects of multiple stresses over time. So they're very dynamic. They can be very resilient. However, they do need, just like us, if something's happened, we need a little bit of downtime to actually make sure that we have um, the ability to recover and become resilient over time. When cyclones or floods or extreme weather events, um, multiple stresses continue to occur, they actually do not have enough time to recover accurately or adequately. So their resilience becomes reduced over time. It means that there's this idea of we run into the risk of a shifting, uh, shifting from complex to an incredibly diverse hot coral habitat. So actually degraded habitats, which is something that we have seen locally and globally as well. So I wanted to introduce this concept called the shifting baselines concept. And essentially what it means is that each generation sees these new environments with new eyes, um, but without the, the, the looking back of previously data, sorry, of previous data collected and actually having a look at how that's changed over the long term, it's really easy to get stuck in one mindset. So if we have a look at this little graph here, what it suggests, for example, is if we actually came and took data from here on the coral really healthy coral dominated site, and then there's an impact, obviously it declines over time or its resilience is actually re reduced. If we're starting to take our data here, we would just think that that's actually exactly how any of the coral or the environment actually looks. Now, of course, if it continues to happen, all of these different impacts, we actually start to have a shifting baseline, which suggests that coral was great here, there was an impact, but if we took it here, this is what we think that it looks like, or if we took it here, this is what we think it looks like. And in a really nice little graph or little picture, I think this really depicts it quite well, is this idea of like, wow, if you looked at something at a certain timeline with no forethought or looking back, we only have this one solid picture. So it's really important. So especially when we're looking at management strategies for how to manage our coral reefs or any environment for that matter, we do need to make, a, make sure that we're looking back at what has happened previously but also not to get stuck there. It's really important that we can't always take things back to how they were, but we do need to have a look forward and back to actually understand where we are at the present and what that actually means for our future as well. So if we look locally, I really wanted to show these examples because we're talking about how what happens upstream and what that actually means and, and impacts for our rivers and then into our coral reefs as well. So those beautiful photos that I was showing you just just before from a place called Goat Island. This is also Goat Island. Now I haven't cleaned up the photos quite as much as some of those other ones were, but as you can see in this photo, huge amounts of really nice, strong, alive, hard coral structures. This is the same reef just a couple of months later. So Brisbane in particular was hit by the, the massive Southeast Queensland floods uh, in February of this year. And very, very quickly, there was a huge change in the salinity 
uh, in the bay and then a lot of the debris over there was absolutely millions of that, millions of tons of debris came out of the river and actually diverted both up both towards the north and the south and also out onto the reef structures now this one here just after this is about six months later um, but this is all dead coral and that's actually all algae that is now covered and growing on top of it instead same kind of thing healthy uh, and now what's happened here is that's actually all dead coral again and healthy corals. And this is that algae that's all um, completely and utterly smothering a lot of this area. And why that's really important is because now we go, well, why did that actually happen? What was the drivers behind it? Um, and how can we actually start to, to understand it and make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen in the future? And also, is it possible to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen in the future? This is actually the first sighting or first reported sighting of this particular algae in over 40 years. So we know that it's not a common occurrence. It doesn't happen necessarily straight after floods. It is associated with increased nutrient loads, but also just like you and me, if a coral gets sick, there are other things that can kind of come in. So when you're feeling a bit down, it's easier to get a second illness on top of you. It's exactly the same for coral colonies. So when they get sick, either other animals can come in to have a, a bit of a munch on them, like a drapella snail, which is a, a coral eating snail, or crown of thorns, or algae, or a huge array of other elements when they get these um, like stacking of events on top of each other to reduce the resilience over time. So it's gonna be short and sweet, but I guess for us, it's like what can be done to make sure the coral reefs are actually still around in the future? So that it's a really big question, and if you start to think in it a little bit too much, obviously you can get really bogged down with what the ideas are. So in my job, uh, there's a couple of different things that we actually do. And one of those is to participate in reef restoration. So there's huge programs all the way up and down the coastline, particularly in the Great Barrier Reef. We've heard the results um, of how much trouble some certain areas are in. Um, and we're actually a part of this. So this is our us over here. So just three weeks ago, I was up in the Whit Sundays. Basically, what we do is actually collect all the coral spawn over a three nights. They sit in these pools that are four by four meters. We look after them for a week and then they're actually redeployed onto the reef. So in water, like a massive hose, and you actually go and deploy. There are other programs such as this, which is actually taking small bits of coral from one area that is healthy and redeploying it to a new area where there was previously coral there. And we're actually doing some projects like that as well. The issue, of course, is still if you haven't got rid of the initial issue, then is this doomed to fail? Now, what I really want to make sure people understand is reef restoration is a fantastic tool, but it is only one tool in a huge toolbox. Now, if we only focused on reef restoration and didn't actually look at climate change or any of the additional impacts, then we're not solving that problem. But also if we're only looking at climate change, but also not at the same time looking at ways to alleviate some of those pressures and, and kind of help out where we can, then obviously we're focusing over here too much as well. So really for us, it's about making sure that people feel connection because again, if nobody's connected, if you weren't part of this, then it's uh, there's a lot less connection to understanding what the process is and having a love for the reef. If it's a degraded reef, not many people want to go swimming at it unless you can actually be part of that solution there. So for us, it's really about solutions focused, but also making sure we're, that we're making progress at bigger levels as well. Which also brings us to the second point. So for me, as an individual, I know what my carbon footprint is. Uh, it's not as low as I would like it to be, and I'm consistently looking at ways to actually fix that, or how can I alleviate my pressure on the world around me? And what I would really encourage everyone to do, and I can pop this in the chat if you like, but check out what your carbon footprint is. There's heaps of different footprint calculators, so you can find one that, that resonates with you to be able to do quite easily. But the idea is that any step forward is a step forward. Again, looking at that solutions face, that solutions focused lens, what does that mean? Are you a meat eater? Can you cut out meat? Do you turn off your lights when you leave a room? Do you have solar energy? Or is it as simple as always saying no to single use plastic and instead using your own water bottle or your own coffee cup, et cetera? So it's about understanding where you're at and what the small changes are that you can make and therefore eventually make slightly bigger changes over time as well. If that all seems a, a, a little bit too much, but you still want to give back and you're thinking about how you can actually participate and get involved in some of these ideas of not just reef restoration or, or anything else, but understanding more about your local environments, we run a few different programs. So you can certainly be a reef ambassador, which is all about talking to people. 
Um, you can be a survey diver where we actually go out and conduct annual reef health monitoring on reefs all the way up and down our coastline. ReefCheck is actually an international company. So ReefCheck Australia is based in Australia, but ReefCheck is operational in over 90 countries around the world. So if it is something of interest and you want to be involved, please reach out and I can give you details. Um, we also do heaps of cleanups because especially after these big events, so much debris comes out of the water that it's real out of the river systems and onto our reefs, onto our beaches, that it's really important that we do spend the time to pick it up but not just pick it up, because if we always just picked up rubbish, that's all we'd ever do. So what we actually do is we document everything that we find and it goes through the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. And we also use a microplastic survey called OzMap as well. So we're starting to collect data, making sure that it's getting uploaded into these really large databases. So we can actually start to track what it is and then see actual live solutions in terms of how we start to clean up and minimise those debris in the long term. Christmas time. So I just wanted to put a bit of a plug in there, but the idea is we do adopt a reef. So there are so many reefs around the world, but within Queensland in particular, we go out and all of our volunteers go out and monitor these reefs for signs of reef health. And it takes a lot of people to do any of that. It's a huge amount of training. Um, but if you want to give a gift of, hey, what's going on in our reefs, you want to give back and see the actively see what you can do, please reach out. Again, we do adopt a reefs just to make sure that we can get our volunteers out onto these sites and continue to monitor them as part of a long-term monitoring program. Because if we don't know what's out there, we certainly can't change it. And of course, always, and this doesn't go just for me or for Reef Check at all, but make sure that you start to like and follow your the, the pages that resonate with you. There's so many programs in citizen science that they, and, and we always need volunteers. All citizen science groups need volunteers. So if you want to learn more about an environment, about how to get involved, about coral reefs or about how your carbon footprint can impact the areas around you, it's really important that you reach out to these groups, get involved with it and get your hands dirty because that's where all the learning really occurs. So thanks so much, Jody, uh, for that, uh, for, for your input. We do have a couple of other webinars. If you're uh, interested in watching some of the previous ones on the debris that comes out of our waterways, um, have a look at the one that we did on uh, plastics uh, just a month or two back. And uh, we talked a bit about how to harness that, including OzMap and some other uh, innovative techniques we have for cleaning the debris out of the waterways before it ever gets there and starts affecting the reefs and other marine life. So thanks um, for that, uh, that presentation, Jody. Um, over to you, David. I can see your screen just fine. If you want to share that as a full screen, then um, we'll be get it good to go. So, yeah, look, thanks, um, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, following on from, from Jody's around um, the importance of reefs, some of the ecosystem services that they produce, um, then talk a little bit more detail about some of the threats and, and, and particularly focus on what climate change means to, to the reefs. And then um, I've got three case studies that are pieces from some very big pieces of work that have been done. And I've just sort of grabbed a few little slides from each of those just to give you um, an indication of some of the work that's been done around runoff um, in the GVR, a little bit of, around um, reefs and coastal protection um, and, and reef prioritization for rehabilitation in the, in the Seychelles. And then um, some work that we're doing with um, coral restoration with um, cobble rub rubble. Um, and I'll talk briefly on all of those. Um, and then look forward to discussing this further in the question time. So um, um, I'll move on um, to the next slide. Um, which, yeah, okay, it's working. Um, so look, reefs do provide a whole lot of different ecosystem services. Um, they're not only important because they are independent um, ecosystems in their own right, but they really, really um, create a lot of opportunities for people and um, for organisms around the, the world. So we have um, the importance of, of connectivity, for example. The reefs are often um, associated with the other um, ecosystems such as seagrass, um, mangroves, if they get closer to the inshore. And in doing it, in, because of that um, linkage to those different um, communities, they there become a really critical part of the whole of the life cycle of many of the organisms that um, live on the reef and many fish um, and um, invertebrates move between those different habitat types. So it's important that we know that we don't go, look, let's, let's look after the reef and let's um, let the seagrass be destroyed because that connectivity is so important. Um, they are important for tourism. Um, 
really, really, I mean, not only the GBR in Australia, but a lot of reefs around the world are draw cards for tourists, um, which really bring in a lot of income for um, communities around the world and are really critical for people's livelihoods. Um, they're important for fishing. Um, they they um, feed people. So while we often say reduce fishing to reduce some of the pressures on the reef, we can't um, ne neglect the fact that um, that globally, coral reefs are really important for the lives, uh, lives and livelihoods of the people who live around them. Um, and of course, um, biodiversity. So one of the ways in which reefs are important is, um, is, is coastal protection. Um, we, in, in places like the Seychelles and the Pacific and in other, um, other areas where we have islands surrounded by coral, um, the reefs actually play a really important role in mitigating the energy associated with waves. Um, that if, we're, if the reefs weren't there, the waves would be able to wash up on shore and, and degrade um, the, the coastal the coastline. And this is happening um, because of the uh, of coral bleaching, because of the impact of land and people on reefs. Um, reefs are getting degraded and in many cases are losing their protective function. And as sea levels rise, this is going to become more of a challenge. And I was just reminded of this a couple of weeks ago in, um, in Fiji when um, there was a really high tide um, and if you look carefully at this photo, you can see um, the fringing reef out there where the, where the waves are making more of a, a white um, color as they, as they break a little bit. But because the sea level was so high, um, the wave energy was able to push past those th that and really smash in against the shore for a couple of hours during a storm, um, causing impact at this particular place. But um, it was quite broad along the coast. And this is a sort of portent into the future where we have sea level rise and, and this will happen virtually all the time um, with the waves and, and, and create um, a lot more erosion on the coast and, and low-lying areas where people live very close to the coast will be impacted in areas where people haven't um, really contributed to the challenge of climate change. So, um, you know, climate change will have and is and will continue to have a really significant impact on coral reefs and those ecosystem services. This is through um, direct impact of heating water, causing bleaching, through um, decreasing pH, increasing acidity, um, having a direct impact on, on, on the reef um, structures and, and ability to build and the, and the organisms that live in them um, through sea level rise and through a whole lot of other mechanisms. And um, we'll, I'll talk through some of those in a moment. But some of the other threats that, um, that, that do impact reefs are overfishing and sometimes the way that fishing is conducted in some places around the world. Um, Land-based runoff, not only of the turbid water that Jody's showed some really great slides of a few minutes ago, but because of nutrients, because of pesticides, and because of herbicides and um, getting those advected into, into reef waters um, really does reduce their um, resilience. Um, impacts from tourism, so reefs getting loved to death um, in certain places. Coastal development is still happening at a really high rates around the world. And um, associated with that is um, degrade, is runoff, um, use of the reef um, and, and impact on, on the reef in its own right. And then, of course, um, people have heard of crown of thorns starfish, which um, often start to eat some of the coral in, and, and they start to, to, to um, swarm and, and, and get um, really rapid growth rates and can cause some massive impacts. So managing all of these threats can really help to increase the resilience of coral and, and associated species to the impacts of climate change. But none of them, if we don't get climate change under control, um, all of these will be for not much use because um, you can be resilient up to a certain um, stage, but um, it, climate change is having such a strong impact, it will continue to, to over, override some of those other pressures. So I guess that in, in terms of climate change, um, we've got global average temperatures really um, raising it at, at quite high rates um, and sea level rises going up at quite high rates. And this is leading to things such as marine heat waves, just generally higher um, temperatures in the ocean. And these are built in, locked into the system and will continue to um, occur even if we got climate change under control now it would still continue to, to rise and sea levels will still continue to rise. 
And um, this is leading to an increased frequency of coral bleaching. Um, and as Jody pointed out, you need some time to, once it occurs, the reefs need some time to bounce back. And if they don't get that, that time to bounce back, it can really have a phenomenal impact. Um, sea level rises occurring um, at, at quite a high rate, um, which challenges um, the, the, the reefs in their own right. Um, and of course, we have associated breakdown of corals um, because of the impact on it. And this um, can, can decrease the, the uh, roughness of the, the coral reefs and, and therefore it's easier for that wave, for the wave energy to pass over from it. So this is from the um, independent panel, ind ind independent panel on, on climate changes summary for poli policymakers. Um, another report that the, um, that the IPCC have brought out um, shows a range of different impacts that the um, climate change will have on the reef and on the species that live there. Um, and they also place a degree of confidence that they have in, in these, um, these statements that they make. And, and I'm not going to really go through these in great detail, but you can sort of see here high confidence, very high confidence, very high confidence for some of these real challenging issues that we face. Um, and um, it is really, really um, worrying that if we get to 1.5 degrees centigrade higher than, um, than we are at the moment, we are going to have massive degradation of global corals um, and we really need to get that under control. So the sort of um, impacts that that rainfall can have on the reef um, and we talked about runoff as a, a as an issue um, can be seen in this slide here. This is the Burdekin River mouth um, during a low flow conditions and um, you can see the water is very clear. You can uh, it, the, the, the opportunity for coral growth is, is quite high. When you do have a, a flood occurring in the catchment, you do get massive amount of sediment running off into the reef. The sediment is easy to see, but associated with that is nutrients, loads, and pesticides and herbicides, which go out and can cause significant damage in, into the reef. Um, there's a lot of really strong programs underway in, in Queensland around um, reducing the impacts of, of runoff from the catchment onto the reef. Um, with the Water Quality Improvement Plan for 2050 and the Paddock to Reef Program um, being conducted by, um, together with the Queensland Government and the Commonwealth, um, looking at improving the health of the GVR um, through reductions of nutrients and, and turbidity and pesticides, um, increasing land management practices, and really doing a range of different um, modelling and monitoring programs to try and understand um, how, and, and look at the effectiveness of some of the management on the land. There's a range of models that are conducted at the paddock scale. Um, there's um, models used to assess um, how much water, uh, how much nutrients and, and, and um, sediment is going into the reef area. And then there's a fantastic receiving water model that's been run by CIRO, which can really understand the, um, the dynamics of the, um, the ocean system. One of the interesting things here is that um, estuaries have not been um, really built into the system the modeling system at the moment um, and because they actually are that ground between the catchment input and the reef it's important that further modeling is done in that space so a colleague of mine at, at bmt has been um, running a program building a model to look at um, some of the the um, role that estuaries play um, and during low flow conditions a lot of the general runoff from the river uh, from from the catchment is managed with if you like within the in the estuary with the movement of water backwards and forwards with tidal movement um, but um, when you start to get um, higher flows you do get those um, runoff of, of um, and, and changes of the salinity so the water the estuaries become almost fresh um, and then you start to get nutrients really flowing off into the reef in those episodic conditions and it's those sort of times when um, when the reef is, is, is under threat. Now, obviously with climate change, there's going to be some periods where it's very dry, but there will be longer also periods where you get a lot of rainfall. And it's during those times when we'll get those additional high pressures into the reef. So just moving on to the second case study that I wanted to talk briefly about, and that was um, in the Seychelles, um, where we looked at developing strategies for large scale coral reef um, restoration to increase coastal resilience. Um, for those runoff purposes that I showed earlier on. Now, this was a fairly big study, but um, in the Seychelles, up to about 96% of their coral has been lost 
due to some really um, high impact um, bleaching events that happened a number of years ago. And the coral hasn't been able to bounce back as well as they'd like to do that. So they really are looking at trying to, and there's massive um, areas where there's coastal erosion and coastal flooding because of the waves that now impact onto the coastline. And um, there is a need to, to do some further um, developments um, in the coral restoration side to try and bring back some of the protective qualities of those reefs. So we developed a series of principles to um, help select where those priority reefs might be. You can't just go off and, and rehabilitate everything effectively because um, if, the, if the underlying conditions aren't appropriate, it won't work. So we've um, looked at um, whether, the, whether the site can be managed to help the coral um, develop at the rate that it should. Um, we looked at things such as um, the ability for any additional engineered structures to be included in the design. So we're looking at, at things such as hybrid solutions. Um, we look at the opportunity for larval supply that could come from natural reefs that can augment that coral restoration activity. Um, diverse habitat types so that you've got that um, connectivity that I talked about earlier. Um, the potential for external impacts such as nutrients and sediment to be reduced and monitored. Um, the potential um, for short, medium and long-term outcomes from the restoration activities to be achieved. So you can't get it done at the scale, you need it done in the short term. And so you need those sort of longer term views. Um, and then looking at um, those multiple benefits and ecosystem services. So can, you, can the, the areas contribute to those? And then building on where existing work is being done. So using those principles and a range of other um, elements, we were able to put together a lot of information around different um, areas of coral um, and, and, and embayments around the Seychelles um, and start to develop a prioritization where this work could occur, where it shouldn't be done. Um, and that is being used now to, um, to um, in con conjunction with a coastal management program to um, implement a lot of um, activity in the, in the reef area, reef restoration area in the Seychelles, which is, is, is really great to be seen. And, um, and, and the World Bank's been actively involved in this. Um, of course, you can never just do coral restoration by itself. You need to be using a lot of different approaches. You need to um, manage users. You need to continually monitor and get new information. You need to reduce all those other um, pressures. Otherwise, you will not get the outcomes that, that, that are required. Um, and this can sometimes be challenging in countries where they don't have um, the policy and regulation um, processes in place that are required on land. And there's a significant amount of, of stakeholder engagement that's required to get this to happen effectively. So the last um, case study I want to talk about is, um, is a bit of work that we're doing fairly close to the um, coral rehabilitation project that Jody talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and I've been working on this in conjunction with colleagues from um, from U University of Queensland and also from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Um, and really um, what we're looking at is, is in a massive cyclone came over the Whitsundays um, in 2017, Cyclone Debbie, um, bringing with it direct impact on the coral, um, the, the waves and the significant strength of, of the cyclone really smashed the coral, broke it into pieces. And you ended up with um, huge, huge rubble beds of damaged coral with very little structure and so no place for organisms to, to, um, to live in and respond to. So we came up with the idea that um, we could um, create little coral bombies to recreate that um, coral structure that's so important. And um, over time, um, they would become um, uh, cemented by natural processes and, be, and, and restore um, the ability for coral to grow at different heights in that in that particular ecosystem. So we we went out and um, and did some work at at um, two places, Hook Island and Bait Reef. Um, we collected just for the modelers of uh, amongst you. I won't going to spend much time on this, but we collected a lot of information around waves, wave energy, so we could um, select optimal sites. And we did this at the the, the two areas, and we used what we called reef bags, which are um, mesh made from coconut um, husk um, and we filled them up with rubble so basically filled a big bag full of rubble the objective is that the bag is made from natural materials will break down over time often um, 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 it, 
creates a little um, probably food source for fish and that over time that habitat structure would remain and um, become uh, um, a, a habitat that coral would recruit to and that other organisms could get um, uh, hide out and, and refuge in. So we, um, we placed a number of these um, in different areas of the reef and we've been monitoring them over time. Um, we noticed that um, soft corals started growing on the reef quite quickly um, and that the structure you can see there in a, in a very flat area, the structure returns quite rapidly. Um, we noted almost immediately that fish started um, coming towards the, um, the reef and in our monitoring programs, you can sort of see how many fish, this is, this is after a period of time when the reef bag has, has broken up, the corals become cemented together and you've got a miniature sort of coral bummy occurring there. And um, the amount of fish that recruits them has been quite impressive and statistically significant. Of course, with all of this, we need to um, do active um, adaptive management. Um, there are a lot of different um, projects underway at the moment by other organizations who are looking at, um, at different elements of, 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 of coral rehabilitation and some terrific work being funded, uh, lots of money being put into it, looking at new restoration approaches, shading, etc. And um, the, the important thing to remember is that all of the work that people are doing in rehabilitation will be all for nothing if we don't get emissions under control. And I think that's what we really need to um, end this. We can buy time. We can do work to reduce um, uh, the, the impacts of land on coral. We can do rehabilitation work, but we have to get emissions under control. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. All right, thanks, David, for that um, uh, for that presentation, which uh, likewise uh, illuminating and disturbing. Um, so <laughs> at the same time, so uh, I guess my first question to both of you before we dive into some of these uh, panel questions um, would really be the same question that I asked some of the people on our um, <laughs> on our webinar about plastics and the, the pollution that we get in our waterways um, is, are, are you optimistic? So let's go back to Jody first. And so uh, we uh, have just heard from David, let's hear from Jody and then from David again. Um, just a, you know, I, th I think I got some of this feel from uh, your presentation, but um, uh, yeah, Jody, are you optimistic? And then we'll turn the same question to uh, David. Uh, I think we have to be optimistic because if we're not, then you, it's very, very easy to get into this idea of a spiral. Um, and so personally, I, I try to always be optimistic, but I also think as David has mentioned, as I mentioned as well, is that we have to be realistic as to what is now. So it's great to be optimistic about what we want to achieve, but the reality is unless all of us are working together and that's at an individual and organisational and a government and international level, about really looking at climate change and going, we really need to make some big changes, then the reality is we are continuing, we're going to continue to chase our tail to fix problems and put band-aids on where we can. Um, so it's a bit of a, a positive and a negative a, a response there, but I, the key element is I think you have to maintain hope and you have to maintain optimism because if we don't, then why are we doing anything that we're doing currently? Yes, that's the same answer we got some of our panel from some of our panelists on the plastics webinar as well. It's like, uh, you know, the, the, yeah, if you, if you, it's it's easy to kind of lose hope when you see the, um, you know, the, the trajectories, uh, but when you see some of these small uh, projects go forward again, the cumulative impact of our collective uh, ability to respond uh, to some of these challenges um, that ought to give us some hope, David. Your thoughts? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same, um, Cray. I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but um, I'm also resigned to the fact that um, there's so much talking done at a global level and so many people promising things that they don't deliver. And I'm pointing my finger at the, the conference of the parties at these COPs every year where the, every country gets together and, and promises that they're going to um, make changes and then we don't necessarily see it. And, and so I'm optimistic that in some places we will have um, some positive outcomes. And, and um, you know, Jody showed some fantastic pictures of coral in Moreton Bay and, um, and um, in the Sunshine Coast. And, um, you know, the water there is cooler. Corals might migrate south. There might be active reefs um, in different places. But when you go to some of these low-lying Pacific Island countries and other places where people's livelihoods and, they, and, and their existence is on these small low-lying islands. And you think of the, the fact that though that climate change will 
have an effect on those corals for people who've had absolutely no um, carbon footprint in their own right. Um, I, I do get a bit um, sad to think of, of what's going to happen to the places that they they love. And, 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 and I just sometimes don't see how in the time that we've got, we're going to stop that from happening everywhere. Yeah. And some of these uh, photos, I mean, if we can help get the uh, word out, I mean, I, I, I'm uh, looking at like marine structures and some of the impacts from uh, increased cyclone energy and things like that. As an engineer, it's, you think, oh, cool, you know, we, we're going to build better, more, more robust structures and we're going to combat this and uh, do some of these things. But when you look at the real impacts in terms of the energy that's being, you know, the increasing energy from one of these uh, cyclones and what that did. I mean, those devastating photos that you showed. Um, well, let's let's turn this back to another question that came from the, the Q&A line. Um, how, how long did that uh, take um, for those uh, coil bags, for those uh, uh, for that regeneration to happen? Uh, you may have mentioned that, but uh, yeah, uh, no, that's we, one of the questions that came in. Thanks very much. We, look, we had some, it's, it's all amazing. The moment you put structure back in the, in the water, some of the organisms just, start living there straight away there's little places where fish can sneak in and out of the bags and um and um we've learned about the bag material so um we've got bags that have um bigger bigger holes in them that fish can use almost immediately but um to get the coral recruitment happening you've got to have a whole lot of processes that um that, that are underway so you need sort of coralline algae and there's a there's a there's a pro process that, that that needs to take place so i'd say about two years um it took to start getting the um, the, the coral cementing, um, and then um, the the actual we we started to notice recruitment of, of of very small corals onto those reefs and so on. Excellent. And a follow up to that question that came in on the chat line as well, um, uh, just a size for the scale. How, how big are these? And is there a minimum size um, where you know if it gets too small, it'll just get carried away by tides and things like that? How how, how big are these? Yeah, look, we our bags were about um, a, 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 a cubic meter, so a, a, a meter by a meter. Um, we 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 would probably like to go bigger. Yeah, you know, if we if we if we had some further funding, or when we get further funding to to build on this, um, we'd look at different um, sizes of, of, of bags. But I do think you can't go too small because yeah, then they become um, very easily moved by waves. So we we with the smart engineers at the University of Queensland sort of looked at what, what size and what depth we could put them in to, to mean that they wouldn't get um, affected by the general types of waves that you'd get and, and currents that you'd get in those places in the reef. Excellent. Um, question for Jody that came in on the Q&A line as well. Um, do you have any thoughts, uh, I mean, Queensland being uh, close to the uh, Great Barrier Reef, obviously, um, the current active body in Queensland, somebody asked, uh, somebody, uh, you know, what, what agency would be helping to encourage better practices and enforcement um, for these kind of long-term sustainability results? Um, any thoughts on the active bodies that would be involved in that? Um, to be honest, David might be a bit better place to, to answer this, but the reality is, is that like if you actually look at the structure as to who is managing any component of the reef or the impacts up, upstream and downstream, there's so many, it becomes a spider web in terms of who's in control of what component. And the issue becomes, A, at the moment there's understaffing of every single department that's going on. So that's one massive issue. But the second part is that not everyone talks together. And so... You might be having a discussion on one component of management in one area, um, but that doesn't actually filter down. So for me, one of the, the key contacts would always be, yes, you've got the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and we've got marine parks that sit under that as well within other parts of Queensland. We've also got natural resource management bodies. So um, those natural resources management bodies are actually like great points of contact, but they're not necessarily the managing bodies per se. So they're not doing the managerial task of checking in on everything and that, unfortunately when there's so much uh everyone's struggling with staffing at the moment I do feel that that's actually very easily seen on areas like the Great Barrier Reef where you just can't monitor everywhere but David you might have some um some comments on that yeah look I, I think you know um, I think in the Great Barrier Reef we really are well served by the structures that have been put in place. We do have um, really strong involvement from the Queensland government, really strong involvement from the Commonwealth government, great involvement from, from NRM groups, um, great involvement from traditional owners, great involvement from tourism organisations who rely on the reef. And then we've got um, 
the the program that 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 Jody runs as well, bringing in the the citizen scientists. So it it really is a terrific um, um, approach, and we've got fantastic um, research as well underpinning it with the different universities who work in the reef um, at James Cook. Um, QUT, um, University of Queensland, Griffith University, just to name a few, um, you know, it's the envy. And yet we still have a reef that gets us in trouble from the way that we manage it. Um, the amount of money and the sheer scale of it and, and, and the effort that's required just means that um, we really just need more people, more money and more impact. And and, and I haven't even mentioned the, the very great efforts that some of their farming in, um, community are making to change their own practices, breaking um, traditional practices that they've, they've used for years and years and years, and taking a huge um, uh, enjoyment out of the fact that they can contribute to an improved reef. And, 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 um, and you've got to take your hat off to all those people, and yet it's still going down. So it's, it's a real, real challenge. Okay. Yeah. And some of these challenges, uh, Brad in the background, maybe we'll get Brad on to share some of his thoughts, but he mentioned that even when he goes to these climate uh, conferences, um, it, it, there, there's no standard um, uh, plant-based uh, options. So, <laughs> um, but that, I guess one of the things, again, recognizing that many of our attendees uh, come from a waterways background, um, maybe over to Jody first and then back to David, what's the worst culprit in terms of what's in the water, what, what's being released in our waterways that does the most damage and maybe even sort it by um, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of what's the easiest thing to stop? Some of the things that are in there, maybe the temperature is very hard to change of the water coming out, but what are the pollutants or the debris or what is it that's coming out of our waterways that does the most damage to coral reef, the lowest hanging fruit that we could potentially stop with some of these uh, innovative uh, stormwater management techniques? Yeah, so I mean, we talk a lot about marine debris because that's a, to me, that's, it's a huge issue, it's a global issue. And I feel personally that that's actually one of the, the easier kind of targets. I mean, um, companies as from where Brad's coming from, coming in at, is there's obviously examples of stormwater um, catchment devices that we've, there's so many different projects popping up about how to actually actively go and remove things from the ocean once it reaches there. But we also realise that reality is we want to try and stop stuff at its source as best as we can. So we want to stop it from entering those environments in the first place. So if we take marine debris out of the, the, um, the equation at the moment, I do think that runoff in general, so whether that's just nutrient runoff or whether that's sedimentation, et cetera, from upstream, and a lot of that's to do with uh, uh, continuing to, in, to grow the population in all of these key areas. So the other issue is that, yes, we can talk about regeneration and that's of those mangrove systems, of seagrass systems, of all these systems, but it actually takes a bit of time for them to actually make sure that they're in place and can accurately and adequately actually capture any of that debris first anyway. So restoration upstream, 100%, making sure that our, our waterways are actually have a system in place that can capture some of those things before they enter the system. Um, but I think despite how many efforts are going on, it's we need time, everyone needs time, but we need time for them to actually to be big enough to, yeah, allow for capture. So I do think, yeah, generically it's it's every time we get a storm, there's just so much sediment that's coming in and those sediments, are completely covered with different nutrients, whether that's from plants or, you know, or a lot of it's actually coming from construction as well. We're finding bits and pieces washing up on our beaches and, and entering polystyrene is the the massive one if you want to talk about marine debris just from the floods. Like we're still picking up marine debris. We're still picking up polystyrene two to 300 kilometres north from where the event occurred. Like it's washing up. It's in being embedded in our, in our waterways now. So oh, wow. how do we actually solve some of those bigger problems yeah it's going to be a multifaceted approach yes yeah. definitely david uh, your thoughts on that yeah look uh, to me there's not one one culprit it's it's a combination of a lot and it really is around how the, the scale so if if it happened once every now and then our systems will bounce back no problem at all but when they happen regularly and consistently it's really really hard for them to bounce back and the way we need to manage it is reducing different pressures and i i, I did some work with some colleagues at griffith uni about um five or so years ago or probably longer sorry probably going back 10 years um but after the 2011 floods we um we monitored coral in moreton bay and um 
we monitored coral that was inside the marine park where there was all um, fishing pressure had been reduced and we monitored corals that were outside of the marine park. And the difference there is the fish species that live around those particular reefs. Um, and within six months after the floods, the corals in the marine park green zones had um, returned back to their way that they were prior to the floods. Um, the others didn't. They, they changed. Um, they lost certain species. The, the fish that would eat the algae off those, um, off as, as, they, as they recruited onto the reef, um, weren't there outside of the marine park zones, and, um, and those coral were affected. Where the fish were present, they were able to eat the algae, allow the light to, to access the coral and let those natural processes take their place. So that really showed to me, um, you know, the, the importance of reducing all pressures on, on, the, on our reefs for them to be able to bounce back. But again, if it happened at the, reg, at the sort of um, frequency that, that we saw last year, um, it would be very hard to overcome that. And, um, and, you know, when you've got other pressures, it's very hard, like climate change, it's very hard to, to overcome that. Yes. Well, what I'll ask you to do, the panelists here, if you can type into the Q&A line, some people have asked about, um, you know, regular uh, working groups and things like that. If you've got some links to anything that you'd want to share, go ahead and pop that into the chat line. And we will then share these resources in the description on the YouTube page as well. Um, so uh, in order, we, we do like to cross promote uh, some of the other um, you know, topics that we've had. Um, and in that light, uh, Brad, if you're on board, uh, feel free to turn on your camera as well. He's, you, Brad's been answering some questions in the background. And I wanted to just get your thoughts uh, a bit, um, how this kind of relates to some of our previous discussions, the last two webinars we've had Brad on. Um, uh, tell us just a little bit about, um, you know, the low hanging fruit that you're trying to stop with the, the business that you're in. And um, how does uh, that relate uh, from our previous webinars on plastics and on urban river restoration uh, to some of the coral reefs? And then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up from there. So welcome, let's hear from you, Brad. Oh, look, uh, apologies. I feel as I'm stealing the thunder. I was actually just sitting back enjoying David and Jody's uh, talk. And then I thought I'd jump on my vegan bandwagon on the in the comments, but uh, yeah, look, uh, uh, I work for a company called Ocean Protect. We, we stop pollution in entering our oceans and waterways. And, and fundamentally, uh, the ocean is an amazing climate regulator. And there's a lot of talk about climate change, but we need to realise that I think the ocean absorbs about 90% of the CO2 emission. It, it absorbs about, uh, our, basically our temperatures would be about nine or 10 times hotter if it wasn't for the ocean regulating our, our climate. And we need to appropriately protect it. And that involves a whole bunch of stuff that David, I think, mentioned, you know, protecting our uh, oceans from being uh, overfished, uh, pollution, et cetera. Uh, and I think we all agree that we need to do a better job of protecting our oceans. So, um, and that, you know, I think it was the point was made before around land based pollution. You know, 80% of all ocean plastic is coming from, sorry, 80% of all ocean plastic is coming from land based sources. Uh, and stormwater is the key uh, transport mechanism into our creeks, into our rivers, into our ocean environments. And um, certainly we can do a better job of that. But I actually wasn't talk talking about um, stormwater and ocean pollution. Uh, the, the comment I made before in the chat was just, we all recognise that climate change is a big uh, problem uh, and a huge challenge that we need to uh, appropriately um, mitigate and manage. And 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 I hear this every time. But the the, sim the most simple and most effective thing we can do is essentially just adopt a more plant rich diet. But meanwhile. I go to climate conferences and sustainability conferences and environmental conferences, and I still have to opt in for the plant-based option. It is a joke. Uh, the, the question has to be asked, can you be an environmentalist and still consume significant proportions of meat and dairy and eggs? And if, and if you really think that, I'd love to have a conversation with you. But <laughs> fundamentally, uh, if we all, uh, and this is consistent with the advice from the United Nations, uh, it, the a shift to a plant-rich diet isn't going to solve all our problems, but it certainly will go a long way to mitigate some of our uh, challenges. But uh, in terms of deforestation, biodiversity loss, climate change, and obviously protecting our reef environments. But um, it's it, we don't need to do it perfectly. We don't all need to be vegan, but I think we need to recognise that if we're serious about change, we need to lead by example. And I think as environmental professionals, we need to do so appropriately. Um, so look, 
But again, I don't want to steal any more thunder. I love David and Jody's yeah. talk. Uh, and, yeah. and Craig, you always do a great job of hosting these webinars. And I think it was a mistake just dragging me in. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we wanted to hear your thoughts because, again, we want to tie this together because I want more people to see the plastics webinar. I want more people to see uh, Bo Miles' presentations. He's got one bad river that he highlighted for us on one of our webinars. He's got three more to come uh, over the next year. And then we're going to get him back on again once he's done with his four bad rivers. Um, and we'll see some of the impacts that these have on our oceans, on our waterways, on our uh, coral reefs. And, and again, see some of these alarming pictures. What can we do differently? And I like some of your closing remarks in some of our previous uh, webinars, and I want everybody to go back and watch those. And when you go to the gym or do anything, you know, you're going to be listening to something. Uh, listen to Brad's podcast. We, we hear Jody on there as well. Um, listen to some of these things. They will help uh, make the planet a better place and uh, help make us better people and better stewards of the planet uh, if we take some of this advice uh, on uh, in, in hand. So um, let's let uh, Jody and then David give final remarks and then we'll close it up while some slides come up with some additional resources on what's coming up next year. This is our last one for this year. Thanks. Welcome for, uh, to everybody who joined us and uh, we'll see you hopefully next year. Um, let's see some of these slides on the extra resources while uh, Jody gives us some closing remarks and then over to David to wrap it up. Thank you. I think really the, the biggest thing is just getting out there, getting amongst it and understanding that really for us, it's all about connection. So for me, if you want to connect, please feel free to do so. Reach out. I'd love to get you out on the water and seeing what's out there because for us, that's what it's really about. Or if you're not local, make sure you go out and visit your local areas because when you know more, you appreciate more and then you are able to protect more. Thank you. What would you, David? Um, thanks, Craig. Look, for me, um, my final remark would be we need innovation. We need more work being done in these spaces to increase our knowledge, but also to think about better solutions, both in terms of how we can go about reducing emissions and um, and making a difference, um, you know, following Brad's advice or thinking of new things. Um, don't just sit there waiting for it all to happen. Be active in helping to change it and um, and, and manage it. And, and that way we can have hope. Thanks. All right. Well, that sums it up beautifully. Um, let's do better. Um, let's do more. Uh, let's raise, uh, you know, raise some awareness um, through whatever channels you have available to you. As water professionals, we get hundreds and sometimes thousands of people watching these webinars. The collective difference that just the people watching this webinar uh, can make uh, on the planet is actually significant. This is not just a little individual effort. Together, we can all uh, make a significant difference. So thanks for tuning in. Um, look at some of these uh, webinars and topics and courses coming up and available to you on demand. Uh, you will get uh, certified um, certificates of attendance and you can get professional development hours for attending these uh, seminars, these webinars and the courses that the Australian Water School offers. So on behalf of myself and the International Water Training Institute uh, that I represent, um, please uh, you know, let's make the planet a better place. Do what we can to uh, make a difference. And thanks again to our presenters and panelists for coming on board. And thanks to all of you attendees. Uh, we'll see you next year. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative, and critical advances in water science, technology, and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.